I'm an idiot. I mean, I had to, uh, I hope the sound isn't all messed up. I had to reset. Something broke on my audio, but yeah, I'm an idiot. That's the, uh, grand explanation of all the things I do is that I'm an idiot. And, uh, that's basically how it goes. Uh, yeah. So yeah, let me know if the uh, sound is terrible. I will try to fix it. But anyway, welcome Brandy B and everyone else to Philosophy Roulette, where I read and review philosophy papers for some unknown reason. Public philosophy at its finest here on Twitch. I mean, we have got a few other philosophers here, but not too many. Um, okay, sounds quiet, but that's just your computer. Yeah, um, all right, I'll ask anyone else if they, uh, how it goes. Because it could just be, uh, what's it called? The settings are a little bad. Maybe I'll try to boost it. Let me give me a half second. I'll put it up a little bit. Yeah, so it's up a little bit more then. <coughs> Hopefully, it's a little bit better. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Can I? Let's see if I can get some feedback. Let me see. Not sure. All right. Actually, I'm not sure. Have I ever read fanfics instead of weird papers before? I've not read fanfics on stream. Um, my friend CJ from NJ streams fanfics uh, quite uh, every so often. So I've been part of other streams where fanfics are read. Those are kind of fun. Um, so if you want to go, uh, yeah, CJ's cool. So, uh, but I've no, I've never actually. I've only ever read um, philosophy related stuff like not it's not always papers i read but i've read um i was reading like a book from nietzsche a while back i want to read some aphorisms i read some uh kafka i read some kafka on stream and that was a good time yeah it's an interesting thing because uh you know it's like a different way of engaging with like the material and to uh to, like talk to people about it so it's an interesting, like, I don't know, like, there's other ideas I could do with this sort of setup where I could read stuff and, like, discuss, but, uh, yeah, I haven't really done that. I should consider it, like, things to do for stream. But, yeah, welcome, everyone, to Philosophy Roulette, where I read and review philosophy papers, see what's going on. If you have any requests, please let me know. I mean, I guess we could do fanfic. Hey, read this. Ah. I'm doing okay. How are you? How are you? Thanks for being here. Hope your day is going well. <coughs> Ooh, analysis. Let's see if this is available. That makes my life so easy when analysis has a paper I can download because it's always short. Look at the green download button. That makes me so excited. Varieties of interpretationism about belief and desire. You guys want to talk about belief and de desire? Rethia says, you're doing good, man. You might need to bring your mic up a bit closer. You're very faint. Okay, yeah. The issue was that um, I had to futz with it. Something broke uh, the other day. So, you know what? Let me just boost this all the way up. Uh, is that better, Rethius? Because uh, Brandy said it was a little low, but they didn't know if it was just their computer. So, uh, hopefully that'll be a little louder. Let me know. So, uh, yeah, so Adam Potts in Brown University, I mean, I just have, like, I kind of, like, have to do this. It's, um, we've got phenomenal, let's see, let's take a look real quick. Interpretationism, yeah, this looks like fun. It's only 13 pages. Let's, uh, go for this unless someone has a, uh, better idea. This guy with the paid access? What paid access? This wasn't paid access. No, 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 no. This is an open access uh, repository, Phil Papers is. And this is a public uh, download. You should see me sometimes. I get very angry. Only 13? Well, that's the whole point. Uh, this is why I go to analysis. It's probably less terrible than reading like the 30-page papers out of uh, like the Australasian Journal of Philosophy that was right there that I was probably going to go to next. So, let's see. 
Let's see if I can open this up. Oh, this is a book symposium. All right. Am I going to bother with the book symposium? Shoot. Yeah, we could read a book symposium. Do you guys... Is there, hey, DeMarshall. Good to see you, too. Good to see you. I've, I've not been around. I know. I've been... Uh, well, <laughs> things have been complicated. Things have gotten very complicated, and it's uh, not always been a whole lot of fun on my side. But, yeah. So there's a book symposium. We can read it anyway. Um, it'll be a little bit of a... It might not be a complete argument, but we'll at least get the flavor of what's going on in this book. So... Here's the link if anyone wants to come to the page and uh, grab it. Rethius, <laughs> this is not uh, paid access. You should see me. I, I, I actually complain about it every so often. I yeah, hope you're doing well, DeMarshall. Uh, everything's good with you, I hope. Um, so let's see. This is this. And you know what? I'm going to do something I don't always do. I'm going to update the uh, stream title. Let's see if this works. Nice. Okay. So. There we go. Sounds like a dog paper. <laughs> nice. Let's see if this works. We're not getting... Nothing's working. Everything decided it was going to break today. That's okay. Nope. Wrong one. Uh, this one. Okay. Good to hear it, DeMarshall. Good to hear it. So we've got this uh, paper on varieties of interpretationism about belief and desire. You know, talking about belief and desire can be kind of fun, so that's why I'm doing this one. So as per usual, as always, let me know what you guys are thinking during the paper. Feel free to interrupt. I It's my first time reading it, too. I don't know anything about this, so let me know. In his superb book, The Metaphysics of Representation, William sketches biconditional reductive definitions of representational states and non representational <laughs> a lot of representationals here in non representational terms. Alright, so we've got states in terms of non representational terms. The idea is an extremely innovative variety of interpretationism about belief and desires. Williams is inspired by David Lewis but departs significantly from him. Alright, so let's find out what's gonna happen then. I am sympathetic to interpretationism for some basic beliefs and desires. However, I will raise three worries for William's version in sections two to four. Then I will suggest a modified version in five and conclude with a general question in six. All right, so whenever just pointing out three worries, the more tentative the uh, person is when they say that they're worried about something they say look i think something's really bad they might have a knockdown argument they might not but when they say like there's three little little things that are problems sometimes they're nothing and sometimes they're just completely devastating so we're gonna see what version of worry this actually is <laughs> you know this is um the fact that they like the book means the worries will be small though that see they start off with the up here being superb uh da. So, just so you can see how someone is constructing what they're going to do. Superb, and then three worries is going to be a minor worries. So, all right. Williams' multi stage interpretationism. What the heck is interpretationism? To illustrate Williams' account, imagine that we have traveled back in time and are radically interpre interpreting Sally, one of our pre linguistic hominid ancestors. Okay, so we're some ancient, like, ape that we may or may not have come from. Donald Davidson's interpretationism started from an agent's disposition to hold true certain sentences of her public language so that pre-linguistically Sally is not interpretable as having beliefs and desires at all. Against this, Williams holds that she does have beliefs and desires, but how do we pin down their contents? The first stage of William's theory concerns source intentionality, pre-linguistic pre Sally's perceptions and decisions. For example, suppose that there is a ripe tomato in front of her and she picks it from the vine. Her perception has the content, there is a red and round thing there. Her decision has the content, I will move my hand in direction D. Alright, so we are basically saying, look, even if we don't think like, say, a fish 
has any sort of like language to it it can still see some sort of red thing and like swim towards it if you want it doesn't even have to be an ape it could just be like a fish and you think well fish don't have language i mean apes might but a fish doesn't i think fish don't i apologize to all the fish out there i'm very sorry um but like but this is looks like what is going on here is that we are basically just projecting language onto them which is kind of an interesting thing to do. We're saying even though they don't have language, we're going to project our language onto it. Okay. Some hold that source intentionality is a manner of internally determined experiential intentionality. Williams considers this idea but rejects it. Instead, Williams explains source intentionality using Karen Neander's externalist tale... <laughs> Big words in this paper. Externalist teleological theory of perceptual content. Sally goes, undergoes an inner physical state and a functionally defined perception that has the biological function of being caused by a round thing with a red reflectance. This gives her a reason to believe that such a thing is there. Sally also undergoes inner physical state A that has the function of causing her to move her hand in direction D. In the second stage, William goes from source intentionality to Sally's belief and desires. In the case of belief, the idea is... Excuse me. Williams interpretationism for any possible subject a a has a core belief that p if and only if a is in a distinct repeatable inner state s such that i uh, such that one s plays the belief role and two the most rationalizing interpretation given the source intentionality assigns s to the content that p all right so basically there's some, like, state that plays the role. Even if you don't have, like, language, you have a state that plays the role of belief. And you are in giving, like, in giving it a rationalizing interpretation. I don't know what that is. But, like, you know, you're giving, you're sort of projecting onto it, it looks like, that the content S, uh, signs S to the content of that thing, that P. All right. So you're basically giving it a belief, even though it isn't, there's no language there. So you're doing the content sort of thing instead. In the case of actual humans, Williams' account requires it at various places that the relevant internal states are sentences in an inner language of thought. So L-O-T, language of thought, that she cannot experience. So while pre-linguistic Sally lacks an outer language that she can experience, she has a hidden inner language. Ooh, hidden language theory. Interesting. This resembles Fodor's two-part story. A person believes that P, just in case one, inner sentence S is in their belief box, and two, S means that P. But whereas Fodor explains two in terms of asymmetric dependence, Williams explains two using rationality maximization. What is the rationali rationality maximization assignment? It is the assignment that over overall maximizes Sally's structural ra rationality, for example, means ends coherence and substantive rationality, for example, means, mean, reason responsiveness, given source intentionality. Okay, so this is what I was saying before. It looks like we're projecting the most rational interpretation. It's a principle of charity is what we're doing here. So we're giving the non-linguistic thing the most charitable linguistic interpretation we can, basically. Okay. For example, let's grant that pre-linguistic Sally has a hidden language of thought. When Sally views a tomato and picks from the vine, there are two inner sentences, S1 and S2, that mediate between her perception and her action in a way distinct of belief and a in a way distinctive of a, a belief and a desire. One perverse interpretation rationalizes her action by assigning the clearly false content, a chunk of mud is there to S1, and I and the content I will eat a chunk of mud to S2. But the interpretation that also maximizes Sally's substantive rationality will instead assign the contents, a tomato is there and I will eat a tomato. So Sally believes that a tomato is there and she desires that she will eat it. The third and final stage concerns the content of outer language. To illustrate, suppose we determine the contents of prelinguistic Sally's belief and desires. Presumably they are limited. Then something new happens. Sally and her group invent an out outer language. The language becomes increasingly sophisticated. At the same time, she comes to have increasingly sophisticated beliefs and desires. What determines the representational properties of Sally's outer language? This raises one, this raises one of philosophy's chicken or egg problems. 
in the order of explanation, what comes first, thought or outer language? Evidently, Sally's simple beliefs are prior to outer language. Williams endorses a stronger claim. All belief content is metaphysically prior to the, out, the content of outer language, even if they develop together. Call this a general mind-first approach to belief as opposed to an outer language-first approach. Then, following David Lewis, William derives the content of outer language from the content of our belief via conventions. All right, so I guess this just means, look, whatever's in your head is in your head first, and then you formulate your language accordingly. I mean, you don't have to say, look, you just you do it in... The uh, the other option is you just do it in the language directly. So my thoughts right now are either exactly what I'm saying to you, because right now what I'm saying to you is what I'm thinking. That's all it is, basically. I'm not pre-determining um, my beliefs and then like formulating my language accordingly. I'm just sort of speaking as I go. The other hand is, or I am, I already have my beliefs, and I'm sort of then speaking accordingly to my beliefs in some sort of, well, the beliefs are there, and then the thought is coming out of them, or the language is coming out of them. Well, I think that constraints of rationality are constitutive of content. Williams offers no master argument. If his theory delivers correct verdicts, it may be along the right lines. Okay. Yeah, I gotta fix my audio. It's a little weird even on my end, so... Okay. First worry, neglecting consciousness. Prelinguistic Sally views a tomato. Following Karen Neander, William holds that Sally's perceptual representing that a round thing is there in a round thing is there is a wide affair that is not fixed by her total intrinsic state. Furthermore, by having a perception with this wide content, she has a reason to believe that a round thing is there. So the most rationalizing interpretations will tend to assign to her the belief that a round thing is there. In short, his account of how perception helps fix belief can be put like this. Wide content, then reason, then belief. But the following arguments su suggest that Neander-style wide content cannot be the whole story. When she views the tomato, Sally's conscious experience that has a content, there is a radish and a ra round thing there that is insep- What? Well, okay, well, one second. When she views the tomato, Sally's conscious experience has a content. There is a reddish and round thing there that is inseparable from its phenomenology. Phenomenology is narrow. Therefore, in addition to having a wide content determined by causal, causal teleological relations to the environment, Sally's experience has a narrow experiential content that is inseparable from its phenomenology. Okay, so you got two things here. I think they're going to tell you if they don't. I'll explain a little bit better. Premise one is based on reflection on experience and is generally accepted. Phenomenal externalists reject premise two. But research into psychophysics and neuroscience provides an overwhelming case for it. So perceptual source intentionality includes narrow experiential intentionality. Okay, so basically what you're saying is, look, you're just getting that small experience. So you've got this wide sort of Thing that's going on when you experience the world, but you're getting one little experience, I guess. So that's what, in addition to wide content determined by the causal teleological relations, that is the state of looking at a tomato and the tomato causally and, and like and directedly um, giving you information about the environment, then you also have the experiential content that is inseparable from the phenomenology, which is this very small thing about a reddish and round thing there. Williams' reductive externalist account borrowed from Neander does not apply to such internally determined experiential source intentionality. So if Williams wishes to uphold biconditional reductive definitions of all representational facts, he needs an alternate internalist reductive account here. Subjects S experientially represents narrow content P if and only if. This is proven difficult to provide because standard models for reducing representational relations are externalist. The argument puts pressure on William's view about the source of perceptual reasons. For intuitively, Sally has a reason to believe that a round thing is there simply by virtue of experientially representing that a round thing is there, where this is matter where this is matter of how the world phenomenally appeal, appears to her. 
the argument shows that this is a narrow affair. By contrast, well, on Williams' view, Sally has a reason to believe that a round thing is there by virtue of a neander representing that a round thing is there, where this is a wide affair involving her being in an ex internal physical state that is normally caused by a round thing in the external world. Since phenomenology is narrow, this is totally independent of how the world phenomenally appears to her. So Williams' view becomes less plausible. At least he neglects a plausible narrow source of perceptual reasons. All right, let me repeat that because it's this is actually an interesting argument. It's a little funky, though. I mean, basically, the author here, I think, is what they're saying is, look, you can see me on Twitch, whatever you're doing. Oh, I should put the uh, paper title on my uh, thing. Here we go. Forgot about this. There we go. But um, basically, look. When you perceive the world, you see me in my red shirt here on Twitch. So you see a red, not round thing, but you see like a red human-shaped thing, basically. Basically, they're saying, look, what you're seeing is a red human-shaped thing, and that's all you're seeing. Like, that's what you get from the phenomenology is a red human-shaped thing you're seeing on the screen. That's the narrow thing, and that's what the phenomenology gives you, a red human-shaped thing. But... The argument that the uh, Williams person here wants to uh, push has, look, you're getting the state that the internal state that has caused the uh, that the red human shaped thing has caused inside you. So you're getting a whole state along with that. Now, that's a question. Do you actually get both? Do you get the phenomenology or do you get this wide thing where you get a, a whole physical state that the world has caused in you now if you can't determine between the two of those things yes that's what the author is saying there's a bit of a worry here that you don't actually have the right uh experience going forward is it the phenomenology of just getting the narrow thing of a, a red human shaped or a red tomato shaped thing or do you get the whole state uh at once so yeah so something to think about like what exactly is your experience do you get the human shaped thing only or do you get a state that is in like caused teleologically according to the neander person like do you get that whole mental state also all right continuing and let me know if uh you have questions folks so here's another interpretationist model of how belief how perception fixes belief narrow experiential content reason then belief Sally's internally determined conscious experiences, pleasures, pains, gustatory experiences, and feelings may also play a role in providing Sally with reasons for desiring certain things or preferring one thing to another. The best interpretation will then assign to her desires that are reasonable given her effective experiences. At the end of section one, I asked why accept Williams' view that a substantive rationality plays a role in grounding belief and desire. Let me mention one explanatory virtue. Intuitively, if it if it experientially appears to you that a red and round thing is right there, you are apt to believe that such a thing is there. That content becomes a belief magnet. It is then very hard not to believe this content. Likewise, if you have a horrible pain, you are apt to desire that it stop. And intuitively, such connections are not merely contingent but metaphysically necessary. But why? This can be explained by the reason-grounding role of consciousness together with William's reason response of theory of beliefs and desires as follows. One, it is in the essence of your conscious experiences to provide reasons for beliefs and desires. Two, it is in the essence of your beliefs and desires that they tend to be congruent with your reasons. For in the absence of countervailing behavioral dispositions, the most rationalizing interpretations will assign beliefs and desires congruent with your reasons. All right, so they're saying, look, the fact that the world is appearing the way it does there's a good reason to think, well, hey, that's what it does. So, I mean, I'm not loving this. It's like, yeah, you can say this, but it just seems to be, uh, this is the question. What is actually, I have a few problems right here. Let me just mention them quickly. Um, if you're just going to declare that something is right there, I mean, this is sort of like saying, well, yeah, but you just defined it as being right there. You didn't, 
give us an argument of what is actually going on. You're just saying, well, the tomato's there, and then it's right there, and then you get all this stuff in. It's not explaining how that happens, because then they go right on and call it a belief magnet. This word magnet should scare any philosopher. I mean, there's a uh, reference magnetism is where you often, I often see uh, magnetism brought up. And basically, what reference magnetism and belief magnet here also means, it means that there's something in the world that is just drawing you in. It is unexplained. It just is a metaphysical um, gravity well to make you either believe something or to make you, uh, to give it a certain meaning. So like you say, well, look, this is a uh, bottle of water. Why is it a bottle of water? Well, it has a reference magnetism to it that draws in the meaning, and that's how you are drawn to it to understand that this is a bottle of water. But, I mean, that is not explanatory. That is just sort of deus ex machina. That is like the world just does stuff. Maybe that is how the world is. I don't know. But it's not... Um, for me, it's not metaphysically satisfying. A lot of times you want, like, people want this sort of stuff to just say, this is just what it does at the bottom. It is metaphysically fundamental. But calling something fundamental just means the person doesn't want to explain it anymore. Just that's what it is, basically. I mean, maybe they can't, maybe they won't. Maybe it is fundamental, and that's why they don't want to, because it's right. But... This is basically them hand, not hand waving, but this is the philosopher holding up there saying, look, this is the best I can do. And so I don't find this like this sort of uh, argument is like, well, look, they're just stating this is the best we can do, given our current understanding at the moment. That's fine. But like, what am I supposed to get out of it? I don't get much because this is like not my area. I don't have any intuitions one way or the other about this stuff, but it's not like compelling to me. So I just want to mention that. Okay. Section three. Second worry. Do beliefs and desires depend on hidden facts? Theories, and belief, theories of beliefs and desire fall into two vague categories. On one side are theories that most ground beliefs and desires in surface level facts. By surface level facts, I mean a roughly miscellany that includes not only facts accessible from the outside, but also experiences, imagery, conscious doings, acceptances of outer sentences in of outer sentences, inner speech, and causal inferential relations between these things. Gilbert Ryle's view was a paradigmatic example. Recent phenomenal intentional theories are also in this camp. On the other side, there are theories that significantly appeal to hidden facts. Fodor's uh, language of thought view is an example. Williams holds that certain f hidden facts are crucial to the grounding story. This makes it open to two problems. All right, yeah, so hidden facts let's find out more <laughs> yeah another thing to always be worried about like if there's something that you can't by definition have in philosophy i i mean i can already tell you i agree with the author on this one if there's something like that is logically impossible for us to go find then well that's a very weird thing that you're appealing to so if uh someone it just in general principle, uh, if there's something that is like logically inaccessible, then why do you think that anyone who claims this sort of thing is even like, how do they even talk about it if it's logically inaccessible? All right. First problem. William's state based form of interpretationism section one implies the inner isomorphism constraint as a matter of metaphysical necessity. Necessity an agent has beliefs only if there is a one one mapping between those beliefs and a system of inner states, representation vehicles, causally mediating between experiences and behaviors. Likewise for desires. These mediating states will be subpersonal and hidden. For instance, when an animal experiences the world and acts on it, the system of mediating inner states realizing its beliefs and desires are not experienced. Williams gives an a priori argument for the constraint. Any possible blockhead an insentient robot that outwardly looks like a human but that works by a giant lookup table lacks beliefs and desires only because it violates the constraint. Therefore, he rejects l the Lewis Stalnack review that a single time slice of an agent might be assigned many beliefs and desires. Okay, so basically, what? I mean, it's just saying, look, you need to be able to. There's something in the head that lines up with uh the beliefs and desires that's the one-to-one -one thing here but um 
Let's, all right, let's see where we're going. I think that William's inner isomorphism constraint is too strong. Here are two illustrations. Okay, this is cool. Let's find out why your beliefs and your inner mental states can't line up one-to-one. -one. Imagine that you are a primitive pre-human of our actual past, say Homo habilis, with many basic beliefs and desires. In fact, you satisfy the inner isomorphism constraint. You have a distinct brain state for each one. But now imagine a twin in another possible world with the same experiences and behavioral dispositions as you. The only difference is that in your twin, they are mediated by a connectionist network. We stipulate that the network is not decomposable into distinct states that are isomorphic to your own mediating brain state here in the actual world, even at an abstract upper level. So William's constraint implies that your homo habilis twin lacks beliefs and desires for the same reason it implies that Blockhead does. He fails to satisfy the inner isomorphism constraint, but that is implausible. For instance, when your twin has a vivid experience of a tomato and reaches for it, your twin surely believes that a red and round thing is there. Here is an intuitive pump, intuition pump. If you could cycle between having the first architecture and the second, say once every hour, you would not even notice a difference and your disposition in all circumstances would remain the same. It is implausible that you would unnoticeably cycle between having beliefs and desires and having none at all. Your beliefs and desires would remain the same. Yeah, so I mean, if you make it so that like, you can't inherently have a one-to-one -one mapping, but you could still have your beliefs and desires, yeah, I mean, that makes sense because look, say you're, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what this example is, but you could just say your brain's changing too fast for there to ever be an isomorphism. So, okay, fine. There is no isomorphism because you can't line anything up because everything's like changing every like few seconds. But that doesn't mean just because it's in flux doesn't mean you don't have beliefs. I'm sure that's happened to everybody. You still have beliefs even when you're, even when you're changing your mind. Here's another example. Consider you as you are now. Now, imagine a distant counterfactual situation in which you have a twin. All the surface level facts about your twin described without using belief and desire are the same. Same inner experiences, same disposition, dispositions to behave, same use of outer language and inner, outer language and inner and outer speech, same causal relations between these things, same interactions with the things and people in the outside world, and so on. If you could cycle back and forth between the actual and hypothetical situations, you would not notice a difference. But there is a difference in the underlying metaphysics. In the hypothetical situation, interactionist substance dualism is true of your twin. Indeed, he lacks a brain, even a block blockhead-style lookup table. Instead, inputs to your twin's sensory organism organs directly cause his experiences, and his experiences directly influence his behavioral outputs. This need not involve agent causation. So your twin's experiential mental life is the same as yours, but it is ungrounded. It is not even grounded in underlying non-physical states. William's inner isomorphism constraint again implies that your twin cannot have the same beliefs and desires as you. But this again is implausible. For instance, when your twin experiences a tomato and so reaches for it, he surely also believes that a red and round thing is there, even if this belief is not realized by an inner representation vehicle, not even a non-physical soul state, mediating between experience and action. And intuitively, your twin can believe that either snow is white or purple pigs can fly by virtue of understanding and accepting, in a functional sense, the outer sense, either snow is white or purple pigs can fly, even if there is no underlying inner state, not even a non-physical soul state. If you discover that you are such a brainless, non-physical subject directly interacting with your body, you should not conclude that you lack such beliefs. Yeah, I mean, this is a little fanciful, but it's basically saying if you're basically a ghost. <laughs> and so, I mean, it, w without even a soul, it's like a non-physical soul state, like you're just a ghost directly intuiting the world, but you still have the beliefs because that's how you're acting and it's like in behaviouring. Okay, maybe, but I'm a little, uh, I'm not entirely uh, satisfied with these um, hypothetical situations of our, like, I don't know what it is to actually, these are very fanciful things. Like, if we were ha somehow one of our ancient relatives that didn't have the language we have, or if we're some sort of, like, direct 
interactionist with the world that does not have even a soul state, but you can still do stuff and believe stuff. I'm not actually sure what this means. Like, it, it's just very hard. But okay. But y the whole point is that, you know, so what? If this is even plausible in the least, then the other theory has got a problem. So, 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 so. Okay, second problem. So, William's view implies that your having beliefs and desires at all is implausibly hostage to hidden facts. Next, we will see that it also implies that what you believe depends on hidden facts. Here is one example. Recall that Williams holds that, as a contingent matter, the relevant inner state of actual humans are sentences of an inner language of thought. Suppose this is right, and suppose that at 10 a.m. one day, for only 10 seconds, your hidden inner language of thought, terms red and green, were interchanged throughout your cognitive system. But you had no idea because there was no change in your surface level experiences and dispositions. You had the same experiences of grass and tomatoes, the same dispositions to accept in inner and outer speech, outer language senses like the grass looks green, by green that I mean that quality, the tomato looks red, and so on. In fact, the in fact, at the time, you yourself were disposed to insist I didn't change my beliefs about what color quantities things appear to have. Given all this, it is quite clear that there was no secret change in your beliefs about what color qualities things appear to have. Your beliefs stayed constant while being differently realized. By contrast, William's specific interstate variety of interpretations implies that for 10 seconds, you secretly had radically different and radically mistaken beliefs about what color qualities things appear to have for he often says that the correct interpretation of language of thought terms is the one that is most rationalizing overall which might imply extreme irrationality in an isolated case yeah so if you get yourself confused for a little while and you had some language of thought that has to uh, correspond to the rest of the world that is a little bit weird um but you know how weird is it? I'm not sure because how often, well, how fixed does like uh, our uh, understanding be and have to be? And w the author here seems to think that uh, Williams really needs a fixed language of thought for us to make any sense. So that's kind of funky. It's true. It's a little funky. Okay. There are then problems for Williams' view that hidden facts are a crucial part of the grounds of beliefs and desires. Williams might consider an alternative hypothesis, the minimal grounding base and scrutability base for your beliefs and desires need not include certain hidden facts about realization involving inner isomorphism and a language of thought. Radical interpretation does not need them. To undermine this hypothesis, one must show that discoveries about those specific hidden facts could make a difference to your beliefs and desires while holding all else fixed, including all surface level facts. But the above cases show that this is implausible. That supports the surface level hypothesis. If it is right then, while you likely have a hidden inner language of thought, it is not part of the minimal grounding base. Instead, outer language may play an important grounding role. So I guess th these are just to say, look, you can't fix what's on the inside, uh, like an inner language and by inner facts, because if they were to change, you could still get by. All right, third worry. Against a general mind-first approach to belief. In section one, I noted that on Williams' variety of interpretationism, mental content is metaphysically prior to linguistic content. Williams does not give an argument for this. He does not. He does note in 11 that individuals lacking outer language can have simple beliefs, but this does not show that all belief content is metaphysically prior to the content of outer language. There is another option Williams does not consider, a pluralistic variety of interpretationism that is mind first for simple beliefs and outer language first for sophisticated beliefs. In my view, there is no convincing argument for Williams' contrary mind first view that all beliefs that all belief content is metaphysically independent of linguistic content. On the other hand, there is a strong argument against it. Intuitively, there are sophisticated contents of a human cannot believe if she lacks access to outer language expressing those contents. To begin with, consider some things humans, ordinary people, physicists, philosophers, can explicitly believe with outer language. There are at least 1,920,762,973 people on Earth. That was A. B. 
either so-and-so quantum mechanical laws are true or else there exists an alien riding on a green zebra while in solving differential equations. C. Some people believe that they believe that within the inner sphere of possibility, everything supervenes on the physical. Could any normal pre-linguistic have pre-linguistic human believe A through C? I say no. By a normal human here and in what follows, I mean a human with normal human source intentionality, the normal range of human experiences with relatively thin phenomenal contents. For instance, imagine Sally as one of our normal pre-linguistic human ancestors. Pre-linguistic Sally's group lacks any outer language, meaning any language they can experience. So pre-linguistic Sally is also incapable of inner speech. Now try to describe possible cases in which pre-linguistic Sally plausibly believes A through C. You cannot do it. Thank you for telling me what I can and can't do. But, I mean, even if they're right. <laughs> Thank you for telling me this. Without an outer language, whatever she experiences or does, it will be insufficient to ground her believing A through C rather than some other contents. Most accept, most accept that there are limits on what non-linguistic animals can believe. Why? Because we cannot describe a possible case in which they believe such things. For the same reason, we should accept the same for pre-linguistic humans. Does this make sense? Like, I mean, really? Like, do, does anyone believe this? There are at least over, there are over 2 billion people on Earth. Um, why can't someone pre-linguistic say, well, there are at least 2 billion people on Earth? Like, this specific thing with this specific numbers? Maybe. Is that harder for some reason? I mean, if you have no pre-linguistics, I mean... Birds can count, right? Birds can count. Maybe they can count really big numbers. I don't know. But, uh, yeah. So, like, hypothesizing about things we don't understand. I find this very hard. Like, I, I don't understand what pre-linguistic things can and cannot do. It's, it strikes me of um, the old argument saying, well, you want to know what a human is? A human is something that uses uh, tools. Because we didn't, we couldn't find any animal that could use tools. And then we found animals that could use tools. And then we were like, oh well, that's not exactly what a human is. That's not what rationality is. It's a person, something that uses tools but has to construct the tools. And then we found birds that constructed the tools. And we found animals that constructed tools. Well, well, that's not what humans. So this is like this is one of these things where it's like you're just trying to get further and further from what we. You're trying to find the right sort of example. So even if I completely agree with the author, which I think I do. I don't know if I agree with this uh, rhetorical strategy right here because it's like, what are we really doing with like all of this sort of stuff? I'm not sure. Like, what does it amount to to give counterexamples to something we don't understand? I don't know. I mean, I agree. If, if you wanted just me to agree with that, like, you know, animals can't think certain things, like, sure. But, like, what are we actually going to get out of this? I don't know. But, like, does that guarantee that us that can think this, this is exactly what's doing, giving us the language? I don't know. Because, like, if I can't do one side of the thing, then how am I supposed to say, well, it's the pre-linguistic that can't do it, and then it's the linguistic that can do it. I don't know if that's the right technology right there. I don't know if that's the right theory. So it's, uh, I don't know. But, like, yes. I mean, I agree that animals can't think this exact number, but why can we think it? I don't know. Now here, oh, t Tropical Geek, welcome. Hi, hi, what's up? Side comment, have you seen online the cats and dogs pressing buttons with words making sentences asking for things? I have seen that not in a while. That's not, those aren't even new videos. Yeah, those are cool um, videos. They're very cool videos. Um, that's right. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think. What was, like, a dog asking for last I saw? Like, yeah, there was, like, a... Basically, like, a streamer set up with a bunch of buttons. And the dog was, like, pressing them in order, saying, like, treat now. Or, like, give treat now. Stuff like that. So, the question is, did the dog actually, um... Have the language, or did the dog realize that pressing them... Oh, I should, yeah, go... Yeah, see, TikTok seems like... Everything is happening on TikTok now. Oh, my God. Did the dog learn 
to press certain things in order and that was most efficient for getting treats? Or does the dog actually understand something along the line of what the, the um, words ha that the there was words associated with meanings there? Or was it just like if I connect this, these like like the ABC, um, then I get another treat if I just do like. Uh, behavior ABC and has nothing to do with the meanings in the actual word uh, of the buttons. Lots of science stuff in TikTok and a lot of crap too. Hey, just like regular life. So yeah, I believe it. I'm sure some of it's kind of fun. Um, our buddy Aristotle um, sent me a TikTok having to do with the Gettier problem. A completely inappropriate and hilarious video having to do with the Gettier problem earlier today. So... Even philosophy uh, stuff on TikTok. All right. So, yeah, I wonder about the dogs and stuff pressing buttons. Like, what do they actually understand? Do they understand the process? Do they understand the words? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, is the process any different from understanding the words? I don't know. All right, continuing. Feel free to ask questions, of course. Now, here is why this creates an argument against William's general mind for his view that all belief content metaphysically that all belief content metaphysically independent is metaphysically independent of linguistic content. William's general mind first theory of belief can, of belief content cannot plausibly explain why a normal prelinguistic human could not believe the complicated things above. Indeed, it arguably implies that such a human could believe the complicated things above. An alternative pluralist theory, uh, pluralist theory S5, no, section 5, can more plausibly explain why this cannot happen. 3. This favors such a pluralist theory over William's general mind first approach. Alright, so yeah, if you think everything starts off in your mind, you have a very hard time explaining very complicated things because we wouldn't have very complicated things in a simplistic mind fair but like again what does it mean to have a simplistic mind we are i i fear dangerously close to begging the question of what counts as uh pre-linguistic and like basic beliefs okay the case for premise one is simple. William's mind for his view holds that the metaphysical grounds of a normal human believing A, B, or C in no way involves the semantics of our outer language. Therefore, it does not involve their having access to outer language that can express A, B, or C. If so, then whatever those grounds are, they could, in principle, be present in a normal human that lacks access to an outer language that can express A, B, or C. Therefore, the mind-first approach implies that a normal pre-linguistic human, such as Sally the old ape, could, in principle, believe A, B, and C. Williams might try to resist premise one. He might agree that it is humanly impossible that normal prelinguistic human should believe A, B, or C. But he might try to explain this in a different this in a way consistent with his mind first approach. But elsewhere, 221b, I present grounds for skepticism. Next, consider premise two. I will now show that a modified pluralist interpretationism that can plausibly explain the limits on pre-linguistic thought. It also avoids the worries I raised in previous sections. Okay, so now we're going to get the author's um, preferred solution. All right, modified interpretationism. The modified form of interpretationism, I will suggest, retains William's basic structure source intentionality and then interpretationism for beliefs and desire very roughly modified interpretationism a belief that p if and only if a is directed excuse me let me say this again <laughs> a belief that p if and only if either a is directly assigned the belief that p by the most rationalizing interpretations given source inter intentionality or a is disposed to accept in outer or inner speech an outer language sentence that is correctly interpreted as meaning that P. So either you're getting the belief directly somehow, or you are disposed to accept the most charitable interpretation. Um, and that's just what your belief is, is this really charitable interpretation. Okay. To illustrate, imagine that Sally belongs to a pre-linguistic tribe. By virtue of her conscious experiences and dispositions to act, she counts as believing a limited range of simple contents about her environment in the first way. 
Then her group invents an outer language that becomes increasingly sophisticated, referring to objects and properties far outside their perceptual circle. They retain their simple mind-first beliefs, but intuitively they now have a new way of believing more sophisticated contents by understanding and accepting outer language sentences correctly interpreted as expressing those contents. As Dennett says, there are really two sorts of phenomena being alluded to by folk psychological talk about beliefs. The verbally infected states of language users and the deeper states of what one might call animal belief. Put differently, there is a single phenomenon with a plurality of grounds. Let me explain how a modified interpretationism might allow Williams to avoid the three worries I raised. First, modified interpretationism might include Sally's ritually intentional, internally determined conscious experiences within source intentionality. This source intentionality helps fix her language independent beliefs, the first disjunct above, and also help fix the content of her outer language, the second disjunct. Second, modified interpretationism only appeals to broadly surface level facts. Instead of assigning contents to her inner language of thought, it assigns contents directly to herself or to outer senses she accepts based on surface level facts, her experiences and dispositions, her and her community's use of outer language. This would allow Williams to accommodate the plausible hypothesis this section 3, that broadly surface level facts are a minimal grounding base for her beliefs and desires. Alright, so this is just the two-pronged approach. This is just, you know, accepting everything. This is not a bad way to go. Just say, hey, look, we have the basic stuff, and that's pre-linguistic. Like, you see me in the red shirt, and you say, oh, I see a red-colored human thing, and then that is like, you get that kind of directly pre-linguistic but then anything that's like complicated you have to like consider the language and then the language somehow gives you the other stuff like i know china exists china is on the other side of the world i've never been to china i know it's there but like yeah i can't see china but like you have to take it on like sort of the language alone and how we use language as a culture then allows me to say well yes china exists Okay, third, modified interpretationism would allow Williams to neatly explain another intuitive datum. Section four, no matter what she does, a pre-linguistic human with the normal range of experiences cannot believe extremely sophisticated contents such as A, B, or C. For instance, consider pre-linguistic Sally back when she belonged to a primitive tribe. Suppose she has a magical subpersonal mechanism that can detect only one condition, exactly 1,920,762,973 grains of sand before her. When this happens, it causes her to, to decide to scratch her head, apparently out of the blue. But she has normal human experiences. Hey, Cinesimiotic, so hey, how are you doing? Good to be here. I hope how, I hope you're doing well. Hope your day is going well. How, how are you? So it does not then experientially appear to pre-linguistic Sally that exactly 1,920,762,973 grains of sand are there. It just experientially appears to her that a whole lot of grains of sand are there. 100 bits. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm trying to get back on the grind. I, uh, I also owe you a paper, so I feel bad. We should do that one day. But, uh. Yeah, we'll get to that. Hopefully soon. <sighs> yeah, I hope you're doing well. Thank you for the bits. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see. All right. To rationalize her head scratching, should we attribute to prelinguistic Sally the belief that exactly 1,920,762,973 grains of sand are before her and the desire to scratch her head when this is so? Intuitively not. She herself has no idea exactly how many grains of sand are there, even if her subpersonal mechanism detects this precise number, just as you would have no idea. I'm sorry to hear that, Cinesemiotics. Body internet is no fun. I've had that. <coughs> so. Yeah, weird things going on on the internet, it's true. Given modified interpretationism... Oh wait, sorry. Yeah, uh, for... Yes, yeah, for the same reason, you can't assign Sally any complicated thing, even if Sally has the ability to recognize it in some uh, non-linguistic way. Is that the most charitable thing to do, though? I mean, is this the most charitable thing? If, like, you can commercial paper. Yes, I owe you. A, I, I do owe you a paper. Um, 
what is the most charitable thing to do? Like, say we have, like, your dog, as a uh, Tropical Geek was saying, and your dog is somehow using one of these soundboards to ask for treats. So the dog has learned to press buttons and is asked and learned how to ask for treats. What is the most charitable thing to do, especially given that Sally in this example is doing something extremely complicated? Why aren't we attributing the belief to Sally? Sally, I'm not sure. I mean, we don't want to, but I feel like this might just be the author's bias at this point. Because the, the author is saying, well, the reason Sally have, has are limited, but that is also projecting in at the same time saying Sally has exactly recognized something very, very complex. Oh, side point on uh, animals doing interesting things. So back in the day, and this is a long time ago now, in Chinatown here in New York, there was an arcade famous arcade in Chinatown where there were chickens and they had one chicken that was just terribly uh, treated it danced because you put a quarter in and they electrified the floor and then the chicken would dance because it was getting electrified the other chicken which lasted a lot longer because it actually wasn't being treated particularly terribly it just wasn't being treated well because it was in this very small box was that you put the quarter in and then you'd play tic-tac-toe against the chicken and so basically there was a little thinking room and the chicken would go in the thinking room peck at a board and then choose um a place to you know tic-tac-toe and of course if the chicken always went first and therefore the chicken um you could you could never beat the chicken because if you go if you play correctly at tic-tac-toe you can't beat you can never lose um with correct play um when you go first in tic-tac-toe now, here's the story. Of course, there was not actually a board. It was just a red light it, the that would light up. And the chicken would pe peck the red light, the button, and it would get a treat. So it was just, you know, simple, simple uh, classical conditioning. Red light, peck a button, get the food, whatever it was or whatever that is. Or is that operant conditioning? I forget my psychology. But, yeah, the fun part is my brother has very good luck sometimes. Like, strangely, impossibly good luck. The machine must have glitched out, and he beat a chicken. He beat the computer playing tic-tac-toe going second. He literally beat uh, uh, an AI. Like, uh, the one thing this computer is supposed to do is to, like, win it uh, tic-tac-toe, and he beat it. <laughs> and we call the manager, or from the manager's like, we don't actually have the prize. There is no prize. You're not supposed to win this game. He's just like, sorry, and walked away. Didn't even give my brother his quarterback. But yeah, was the chicken actually, should we interpret the chicken as playing tic-tac-toe? No. But like, there was no reason to think it was actually doing anything more sophisticated than just pecking a red button. Sinister Miyak says, most compassionate thing to do. Take the owners, put them in a bigger box and like that, and let the chickens come home to roost. Yeah, basically. Um, I think what ended up happening to the chickens was, after enough complaints, the chickens that lived there were given a nice retirement on, like, a nice farm upstate. And, like, they lived out the rest of their days in the best possible conditions. So, I don't know if that's a happy ending, but at least people com enough people complained and the uh, owners... Uh, relented and so those chickens at least had a good end of life to make up for the crappy uh, other times that they had but yeah my brother beat the actual chicken like and if you talk to old New Yorkers they know about this like thing and it's like he actually beat it like you can <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous yeah so this is the question but what it what are the criteria for us attributing thoughts to other things, especially things that we can't talk to? And if they're doing sophisticated stuff, is it unfair to uh, attribute something more simplistic than um, what their actual behavior is? So I don't know. Like, I don't know if that's fair what's going on here in this paper. So, okay, let's continue. Like I said, feel free to ask questions. Just but like, if we are giving the print, if we are really working with a like strong principle of charity here, you you don't get to pick and choose when to apply that. Uh, so, 
feel like this argument's a little ad hoc on the author's part. I, I agree with them, but I don't know. I, like I said, I don't know if I'd argue for it in the same way. All right. So given modified interpretationism, then the only way for Sally to believe sophisticated contents like A, B, or C is outer language first as opposed to mind first. She must learn an outer language. There will be some story about how the sentence of her outer language come to express A, B, and C that does not appeal to an explanatorily prior ability to believe those contents. And then she can believe those contents by understanding and accepting those outer sentences. Surely this direction of explanation is possible. Why not think it is sometimes actual? I think humane slaughter would have been more compassionate. Thing of the avian PTSD and hostic sy syndrome. Yeah, I'm not going to advocate for um, murder uh, live on Twitch. That would definitely be TOS. So, I will let you, I will leave you all to your uh, own beliefs right there. <laughs> ah, humans are wonderful things, aren't we? Modified interpretationism then may better fit with a few features of our concept of belief than Williams variety. Evan, how are you? Good to see you. I hope you're doing well. I see you're like I see you pop up. I watched some of your streams. I think you're uh yeah, thanks. I hope you're doing well. I see you get some uh, you got like some massive raid the other day. I saw you were like at like eighteen hundred people, like congratulations. So uh, I mean I stopped by for a bit, but like yeah. Ad hoc, ad hoc, ad chicken, yes. <sighs> I should have known the puns were gonna start. <clears throat> Yeah, and congrats on the success. On at least some, you were doing well the other day. I saw, so look good. Also, notice that when it comes to sophisticated beliefs, it is quite similar to his actual view. The only difference is that while William holds our beliefs, slaughter of the chickens. Not yeah. <laughs> the only difference is that while Williams holds that our believing A, B, and C is grounded in our accepting hidden inner sentences expressing those contents, the modified view hold, holds that is grounding in our accepting outer sentences expressing them. Therefore, in moving to modified interpretationism, he could retain his main ideas, for instance, his rationality, maximizing theory of how terms and sentences get their contents, and his functionalist theory of what it is for a sentence to be accepted in the belief box. He could simply apply them directly to outer sentences. Yes, I am fascist about how I interpret things. Um, add friend. Did you send me a friend request on Twitch? I mean, I mean, I'll add you if you didn't. If you did, I didn't see it pop up yet. But uh, sure. Um, yeah, fa <laughs> fascist interpretationism. Yes, everyone should believe just like me. Okay, modified interpretationism rejects Williams' inner isomorphism constraint, so how does it avoid the intuitively mistaken verdict that Blockhead has beliefs and desires? The answer is that on modified interpretationism, understanding and therefore belief requires source intentionality involving consciousness and causal inferential connections to such source intentionality. Blockhead is an unconscious robot that fails to satisfy this internal constraint. Okay, so basically you need some sort of consciousness. Uh, theory but see again this is seems a little ad hoc katie thank evan thank you evan <laughs> but thank you for the uh 4679 bits i appreciate that um no ad friend oh ad friend like ad hoc ad chicken ad friend all right And Katie, thank you for the bits. I don't know what Evan did for that, but thank Evan for me, okay? Also. <laughs> I've never had a vicarious bits given, but I guess that's one of these things that can happen. That's cool. Thank you. All right, so we're right at the end of this paper. So uh, let's get to the end. Let's see. Yeah, this is, this is the last bit right here. How does rationality maximization apply to, the, to plus and gain? What does that even mean? Finally, a general question. William ingeniously develops a rationality maximization theory of content determination for some of Sally's inner uh, language of thought terms. Logical terms like and and explanatory terms like motion and moral terms like wrong. How does the view generalize to other terms? For example, consider Sally's lot terms plus and is a game. On William's rationality, thank you, Semiotics, for another 100 bits. I appreciate that. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Get for everybody for the uh, giving today. I appreciate it. On Williams' rationality maximization view, what are the basic underlying non-representational, inferential, or dispositional facts that determine what they denote? And for these two terms, what are the relevant basic principles of substantive rationality such that the correct assignment of denotations to them is the one that maximizes Sally's conformity to those principles? Is rationality really part of the explanation of how is a game comes to express some messy property P? Right, this is a lot of words in this paragraph. I'm not sure. All right. How do we talk about other basic facts or ba basic things like like addition you need to have basic building blocks of uh rationality like what it is to add one plus one tropical yes oh kisses yes 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 kisses all around so that's the question how do you get the basic um terms in that you need to think with so uh, how does William solve under determination worries here what makes it the case that Sally's language of thought term plus denotes the plus function rather than the cross function? An arithmetical function like the plus function, except that it gives deviant results for a few specific numbers in the Googleplex range too large for Sally to compute. And what makes it the case that is a game expresses property P rather than property P star, where P star has the exact same extinction as P across? Oh, now you're just overdoing it, Sin Semiotics, but thank you. I appreciate the four, what is that, 400 bits? Wow, thank you. Um, thank you again. All right. So more kisses. <laughs> uh, thank you for the bits. And what makes the case that is a game expresses property P rather than property P star where P star has exactly the same extinction as P across high tropical yeah, tropical geek is like, yeah, what? across all worlds except that P star goes somewhat deviant relative to a single extremely remote world satisfying complete description D where D is too long and alien for Sally to understand. Sally's actual fine dispositions do not distinguish between these interpretations. She cannot even consider the specific remote cases and idealization faces well-known problems. So would Williams appeal to naturalness to favor the straight interpretations over the bent ones here? If so, how might this be derived from his general rationality maximization view? Okay, so basically at the end, um, the question is, how do we even get basic um, understanding of things here? And we don't know, but th to be fair, I don't think anyone knows exactly how we get... Um, we really understand some of our basic views. Like, how do we really understand the term plus? That's a whole thing in itself we could go into for ad nauseum, ad friend, ad chicken, ad hawk, ad nauseum. We can talk about what this plus and plus versus quas, to tell you the truth. This is a whole different thing. So the fair um, thing to say actually is, I think this is not nice. Like, you don't need to... This is not William's problem to solve. Maybe it is... Maybe Williams does want to solve this, but I don't know why Williams has to solve this. Um, no one has solved this. This is a very big problem, and no one has solved this. So why does Williams have to solve this? I'm not sure. Does Williams have to? I doubt it. But does Williams want to? I'm sure Williams would want to solve it if Williams could. Um, but the funny part is... is as the author said above, they applied to a reference uh, magnetism. Actually, it was a belief magnetism above. But this is how do you actually talk about this? This is exactly the same problem. You talk about so, like the meanings in the world. How do you fix the reference? There's a reference magnetism. It actually pulls you into the specific thing. And this is one of the theories that of uh, how we get meanings and reference. We fix things because the idea that like this is a bottle, we are the reference of what it means to be a bottle pulls us in to get the right meaning. And so the same thing could happen here. If you're willing to talk about a magnetism, you can you can make the same move at this point. Now, are we going to have problems with like induction and uh, all sorts of things uh, when we're talking about uh, quas? Like, so when it happens outside the normal range in like uh, new middle of induction, um, what's his name? The Goodman argument. Yeah, that's all gonna happen. But 
even in the you could there are definitely this naturalness sort of arguments. Yeah, hey, I'm talking sem- se- se- semiotics. I am. So, um, how do you do that? So this is actually right here. I think this is um this is a worry. Uh, how are things determined, and are they underdetermined? Of course, they're underdetermined, but they're underdetermined for everybody. So. is just sort of par for the course. Um, How does rationality maximization apply? You know, if as I was interpreting this rationality maximization, it was on the principle of charity. You have to give um, other people, other agents, animals, whatever, um, charity. Thank you for another hundred bits in the semiotics. (laughs) <laughs> um, I appreciate it. Oh yeah, and Gerby, thank you for the follow. Um, I didn't see the uh, alert before, but thank you. I have to get my alerts hooked up. It's one of the. I will need to get a new computer, and then I want to get alerts hooked up because this one will just die under the extra weight of anything else running. But yeah, so once you start being charitable, and thank you for the three bits now. Um, once you start being charitable, I don't know why you're so worried about basic stuff. Can't you just be like, this is how we do stuff? I don't know if it matters. But anyway, if there's any more questions about this, um, thank you all for being here and listening to this uh, paper. This was um, Varieties of Interpretations about Belief and Desire by Adam Potts. Apologize how I say your name, Adam. Um, but yeah. Is questions like how, like if you have this sort of direct access to the world and you say, well, look, we just have these beliefs and then we interpret them. And but then what happens when things get complicated? That's basically what happened in this paper. We just like, well, if you do this mind first thing where you have beliefs and then you're just trying to talk about your beliefs. Well, then what happens when your beliefs get very complicated? And if you have and, and since our experience is in some sense simplistic we don't ever have like the experience of one billion seven hundred and nine hundred and seventy six thousand whatever blah 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 like that's a very weird experience to have so how do you actually talk about that if you think you're getting more very direct access to the world and so that's basically the thought here is they're very complicated things but our experience isn't like that we have like red spheres for tomatoes now, if you actually want to question this, like maybe our experience is a lot more sophisticated than this author is giving us credit for. Maybe our th- the idea that we're just seeing like a red circle and that's a tomato, that's just wrong on certain phenomenologies. Like, do we actually just see red spheres and be like, oh, that's a tomato? Or do we see like tomatoes? And then we sort of think about red spheres afterwards. And you have um, definitely people that uh, take the idea that we see the tomato first and then theorize off to the red sphere. Sinisemiox asks, what if our beliefs don't manifest until we inquire internally? In other words, dot, dot, dot. Um, Yeah, this is part of the thing. It's the question of where do the beliefs come from and how sophisticated are they? So I think that's, that's actually what the author wanted to say here was, in some sense... Once you inquire with them linguistically, then you are doing more with the authors as is right. Sinasamayotic continues. Could the sophistication of the beliefs be a result of considering what the beliefs are? Yes. And I think that's closer to what the author's conclusion was here is that you have to give us some sort of, and they called it external language here, where they said that um, this outer language, uh, like right here, outer language and once you start using the more sophisticated linguistic tools then you can do more stuff but they were not giving us that much credit for our phenomenology so this is the question i'm asking is that yes we know that once we start doing complicated things we can be very sophisticated i'm saying Maybe even at the get-go, we're way more sophisticated than the author is understanding. Maybe the author's 
understanding of like how they interpret the world is wrong. Maybe they are straight up wrong with how they are interpreting the world. Maybe the idea of like a tomato itself is actually a very complicated thing. It really is. Like the idea that like I don't have anything like super complicated right here. Um, I have a mess right here is what I have. But like the idea that like you see this as a bottle, do you actually see like any shapes or like raw shapes here? Probably not. You have to really um like it's a see-through thing, so you're seeing different reflections. You're seeing the colors behind it. Like it's a very sophisticated thing actually to be able to see a see-through bottle on the other side of whatever like mediated internet this is via Twitch. So I may re like I'd actually be out like I might actually just reject the phenomenological interpretation this author gives too. So I'm not loving um, the, this author's phenomenology. It's actually very typical of me to uh, dislike that. You see, Tropical Geeks is a 3D hyperbo hyperbola becoming a square. That sounds very accurate. That, that sounds about right. So this is the thing. It's like, whose experience are we talking about here? And this whole paper was the author talking about Sally, this sort of pre-linguistic thing and saying how simple Sally's um, experience was. I have no idea how simple Sally's experience was and, I'm, and I don't think the author has my experience right either. Since Samiotic says, you know, potato plants sometimes bear fruit and they look like tiny tomatoes. They're poisonous. The tomato thing could work here. Yeah. Ketamine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so again, things are more complicated than they may seem uh, in the phenomenology. They may look like tomatoes. There was a lady that um got arrested, oh, this was a long time ago now, for selling tomatoes on the side of the road. She got reported to the authorities for being a major drug trafficker because apparently opium plants have tomato-like um, fruit. And she had a giant opium field or something. And she was, like, selling the opium tomatoes just in her stand. And it was funny because um, the feds here in the United States, they, you know, it was, like, some sweet old lady. They didn't put her in jail. They gave her, like, a suspended sentence because she wasn't actually selling drugs. She was selling the fruit from the drugs, but she never actually sold anything to be, uh, to sell any, dr like, to make anyone uh, high. So they, they let her off, whatever it was. But it was just like she had some giant, um, <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know what Tropical Geek is up to tonight. I hope Tropical Geek is having a good night with whatever uh, drugs Tropical Geek likes to have. Um, But yeah, so it's like, is it a tomato? Is that what you're really thinking? I don't know. No drugs. Okay, that's fine, too. Uh, there is another st uh, philosophy stream called the Ask a Philosopher booth. Um, ask, yeah, what is that? Yeah, it's the Ask a Philosopher one. And one of the philosophers there told a great story about a uh, very famous philosopher who was saying basically um, taking acid or taking psychedelics. And the very famous philosopher was saying how they thought it was just, they, they gave it a they were like, no, it's bad. But they had never taken psychedelics. They had never done it. And this was at a conference or whatever. And he had, like, psychedelics on him, like, really good quality stuff. And so he was, like, after the conference, like, after the dinner and, like, everyone was, like, discussing this, he was like, do you just want some acid? <laughs> He's like, I could just give you some and then you could, like, actually experience and know what you're talking about is just instead of just the theory. And the person was like, mm, can't really, like, for other reasons. But it was just like... Yeah, like, what experiences are you really taking as fundamental, and what are you deriving from them? It's one of the big problems in philosophy. And I think this uh, bears on this paper here, too, so. <sighs> anyway, okay, this is going to be it for me tonight. I'm trying to get myself, just dip my toe back into streaming. I had, I've been having audio problems on this computer, so um, I hope it, it came out all right. I uh, didn't. I had some. I uh, thank you all for the bits. The uh, what was it? I had the uh, 
it follows um, the end of, end of the discussion. So thank you all. If you have any questions, let me know. But I'm going to sign off in a f few seconds. Uh, can't really handle. I could probably do another paper, but I need to like do other stuff. So this is going to be it for now. Oh, really? Wow, Cinesemiotics. That's a... Uh, that's like sophisticated. You get the uh, legal infusions of like ketamine for PTSD. Yeah, that's a. That's got to be mind changing. Yeah, that's because they they, I mean, there's been more and more research in that area saying how this sort of like the mind drugs actually are super useful for PTSD and other sort of traumatic experiences. But yeah, thank you all for being here, and uh, we can discuss drugs and philosophy later. So have a good night. Ah, uh, so Tropical Geek is ahead of us in the math. That's what it is. Be well, all. Uh, stay safe out there, and have a great night or day, whatever it might be. Bye, bye's. Actually, let's check real quick if there's someone to raid. Um, t I am taking off. I'm just going to go see if I can send it. Is anyone, uh, if there's anyone to raid, I'll send us over there. But, uh, nah, no, no other philosophers are on right now. Okay. Have a good night. Have a good night.